some of the official predictions made about climate change sound biblical in scale. More drought, more famine, more flooding, more of the most powerful tropical cyclones, and of course, the seas rising. A familiar litany. And one, they say, we need to do more to fight. Something that will need rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. Our current no-action path is like this, rising carbon emissions. And that would take us to a more than four degree rise by 2100. But there is policy in place that should restrain carbon growth onto this path. That probably means about a three degree rise. And if countries make good on some of their promises, it should be a touch lower than that. Scientists, though, have been hoping for this path, which would mean about a two degree rise. Now, though, they say we should aim for under one and a half degrees. Now, that half a degree change may not sound like much, but scientists think it could radically reduce the harm done to our world by climate change. The thing is, though, to get there, we have to reduce our net carbon emissions to zero by the year 2050. And that means huge changes to the way that we live, to how we get around, to how we generate electricity, to how we arrange our cities, to what we wear, even to what we eat. You can see why zero emissions is so radical if you look at carbon emissions in historical context. Hitting zero by 2050 would need a very sudden shift in direction. It's about making the Chinese leadership, the Indian leadership, many of the African leaders decide to move away from coal. And unfortunately, that's quite expensive for these countries. And the real issue is whether and who is prepared to pay the substantive costs of a fast switch out of this most pernicious form of uh, fossil fuels. Now, individual countries make their own climate plans. Getting them to follow through, though, is hard. For one thing, getting to one and a half degrees would mean investing two and a half percent of the world economy every year from now until 2035 into energy infrastructure. According to Bloomberg, that's a sevenfold increase. Two and a half percent of our economy would be about 50 billion pounds, more than we spend on defense. We cannot hold to the current standard of living and really radically decarbonize. This has cost to us, we are to be blunt, living beyond our means and no politician wants to tell us that. The fact of climate change is no longer in dispute. How we respond to it, however, is a political challenge that will only become more acute in the coming decades. And the price tag is rising. Chris Cook reporting. So, is it possible to get the planet to align around the latest science? In a moment, we'll talk to Simon Beard, who studies existential risk at Cambridge University, and to Baroness Worthington, who's drafted the UK's Climate Change Act 10 years ago. But are the chances of a global response weakened when the leader of the world's second largest polluter is sceptical. In the US, polls show that Americans' views on climate change are increasingly polarised. Republicans and independent voters are increasingly likely to think the seriousness of global warming is exaggerated, whereas Democrats are more worried about it than before. So let's try to peek into the mindset of the administration there. I'm joined now from Washington by Myron Ebel, who was Donald Trump's environmental um, advisor during the presidential transition period before the inauguration. He's director of the CIA think tank that campaigns on behalf of the US energy industry and deemed the Paris Climate Agreement an unprecedented power grab on America's consumers and economy. Very good evening to you, Mr Ebel. Um, do you think this report, this latest one, will change the administration's view on climate change at all? No, I don't. I think uh, the United States uh, is uh, divided, as you said. I think some states like California and New York and some of the New England states are pursuing the, the European Union plan to make energy more expensive. But I think uh, President Trump and the heartland states that elected him are on a very different, uh, very pro-energy path. Yeah. I mean, is the problem here that effectively belief in the United States has just gone completely political? That it's almost identity politics. To show you're a proper hard Republican, you just adhere to the view that climate change is a global plot, that the UN is trying to take over the US. I mean, is that what's really going on here? 
From my perspective, it's become identity politics for the left uh, to, uh, to claim that there's uh, a, an imminent crisis. Uh, the problem with this report is it foreshortens the, the, the problem. The rate of warming, according to the data, is much slower than the models used by the IPCC. Uh, they also don't consider the fact that we've already had one degree of warming. They, they, they let, let me interrupt you because they asked me. So let, let me interrupt because I think what you're trying to do is to sort of show that you know more about the science than the scientists, which is sort of not the case because they're the scientists. What you have to do is show not that you're cleverer than the scientists, and there were a lot of them involved in this, but that the scientists have somehow been taken over by a plot or have been infected by corruption or payments or politics. Now, have you any evidence that the science... Not, I don't want to hear your argument that science is wrong because you don't know anything about it, but have you any, any evidence that the science has been corrupted in some way? Uh, the United Nations, when it created the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, charged it with supporting the climate agenda of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. It's meant to be a promotional body. It's not meant to be an objective scientific advisor. That if you if you go back and look from day one, it has it has been a promoter, not a, a neutral scientific whoa, whoa, whoa. body. Let me just let me pick you up. So, do you think the scientists? who reviewed these 6,000 papers to produce this latest publication, 86 lead, lead writers, do you literally think they don't believe what they have said? Is that your contention? Uh, they're climate campaigners first at the highest level wow. rather than objective But you're a climate scientists. campaigner more than they are. They're not even paid, these guys. You're paid. I mean, they're not, they're not paid. It's absolutely... <laughs> Go on. Uh, look, look, we've had, uh, the, the study says that we've had about one degree of warming already. They don't consider the tremendous benefits that have flowed uh, to but humanity. But again, the, again, the, the sorry. Flourishing again, you're trying are, to show you know more about the science than the scientists, and you don't. So I, I come back to, do you, because I'm fascinated in this sort of personally, as, 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 as to denial as a sort of human phenomenon. Do you ever think there may be a small chance that the scientists have simply done the work, straightforwardly looked at their results, published their results in an open-minded and unbiased way, and presented their conclusions? Because really, you're just saying either you know more or that they are somehow lying to us about what they really have found or what they believe. I've, I've, I've investigated uh, the claims and I find them wanting from uh, multiple viewpoints. So one of them is that what they are proposing needs to be done will have much more deleterious effects on the planet and on humanity than the problem that they have identified. I, I have also tried to show you that the problem is, is in slow motion compared to what they're claiming it is. And I believe that they're claiming it's, it's an imminent crisis because that's their charge from the United you, Nations can at you the imagine, highest level. But I mean, okay, so you're saying they've been instructed to say what they're saying. Can you imagine anything that the scientists could say that would persuade the administration that it needs to take this more seriously? Uh, no, I can't. I, I think that the administration and the American people are uh, pretty convinced that a pro-energy agenda is much more uh, viable and will have much okay. better results than an energy rationing agenda. Myron Ebel, thanks very much uh, for joining us. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Well, as I say, joining us here in the studio, Baroness Bryony Worthington, lead author on the UK's uh, 2008 Climate Change Act, and Simon Beard from the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk at Cambridge University. Good evening to you both. Simon Beard, do you think human beings are capable of dealing with a problem like this? Yes, we are. And the good news is climate change is anthropogenic. Human activity is causing it. And that means we have the capability to stop it. You know, this isn't sunspots, this isn't some global conspiracy. This is something that we're doing and we can undo. We have a bright future ahead of us and we have the capability to bring that about. And it would be an incredibly good deal to do that. So you'd do much that rather we were causing it than it was something else because that means we have agency in this and we, 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 we can do something about it. When you study human extinction, the thing you really look for is an extinction that people are causing and that they know what they're doing. Right? The things that we worry about, 
are the things that, like with technological development, where there's a risk but we don't really understand it, or where something might happen and you have no control over it? Space weather, <laughs> asteroids, and so on. Those are much scarier. <laughs> Climate change is just a question of what do you think is going to be the best investment for the future? And, you know, it's in becoming increasingly apparent that actually um, climate mitigation is going to achieve a great deal for us and our children. Right. OK. Um, Baroness Worthington, I'm sure you disagree with everything you heard from Myra Lee Bill there. I'm just guessing, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. So, so. so we can sit blaming the Americans for being sort of deniers. However, is it not the case that political realism in Europe as well is an obstacle to all this? Because actually the US may well meet its Paris climate change commitments, mm -hmm. despite the Myron Ebels. Yeah, they And there may be well. European countries that don't. Well, Europe as a whole will, I'm pretty certain, because we're already overshooting our targets. And in fact, we could go further in Europe. But that's largely because we've got some quite sensible policies. Uh, we've introduced um, prices on pollution, because at the moment we're just emitting all of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere for free. And we know it's causing a problem. And, you know, Myron likes to point to uh, the European Union as being anti-energy or some such um, statement. That's nothing could be further from the truth. We're unlocking new sources of energy and we're buying down the costs of that energy so that other countries can use but it. But it is interesting, isn't it, that aren't politicians who are going to say... I mean, they're politicians who are struggling to find three billion, four billion for social care, mm. let alone 50 billion <laughs> to spend into energy so we can have the same energy we have now except cleaner. Um, but the but except with... cleaner is quite important because there are co-benefits to us doing this. So cleaner air in cities is going to reduce the National Health Service bill because we'll have fewer people suffering from all the related health impacts of the diesel fumes that are currently choking our cities. So there are lots of but we did, cost savings. We, you, you ask a government, hey, let's put up petrol tax. How many years is it now in a row that we've, we've, we've frozen petrol tax rather than put it up fuel duty? Well, I, yeah, the, there's a big controversy about the fuel duty price, but actually, if you look at other policies that we've seen in the power sector, just putting a price on a loan isn't actually the important thing. The important thing is to recycle funds and to provide deployment support for new technologies. So the new wave of electric vehicles that are coming, um, they've been really pushed forward by policy, and policy in China, most interestingly. So, you know, Europe's got a bit of a way to catch up on transport, but I'm sure we will do so. Simon, isn't the problem here... Basically, there are huge time lags in everything we do, so there's always a kind of let's do it tomorrow rather than today. And the effects are not always felt by the same people who have to take the mitigating actions. So my actions don't come back and thwack me in the face, do they? I mean, my actions are affecting other people. Those are precisely the problems which lead to sort of selfish behaviour around there and stop, stop human beings solving things. Absolutely. And, and if we'd been doing this when we first discovered how you know, catastrophic climate change could be, actually, you know, in the 1960s, in the 1970s, we'd be having to do an awful lot less. It would be a lot easier. But at the end of the day, it's still a really good deal. It's still going to benefit many people who you know, are currently living. It's, it's not just the very young. It's not just our children or our grandchildren. All sorts of people are going to be benefited by not having to go through the terrible risks, the terrible catas catastrophes that climate change could be. And, you know, climate change has been a, a big controversy for a long time. And when I was young, I'm a millennial, when I was young, it was about if, then it was about when. Actually, in the last year, you know, it's about how. And that's what this report's yeah, about, and that's what gives me hope. But, but there, there, there are three tragedies of climate change. The first is the tragedy of the commons, which is what you're describing. We've all got to act together. And that will have to be solved by multilateralism. We'll have to reinvent that. And, and the IPCC is well, leading the way. But, the, but there is another important tragedy, which is the tragedy of the incumbents. And what Myron represents is that, is that, is that representing of the powers that are benefiting from the status quo. And what we've got to do collectively as citizens is say, you know what, actually, at the time of fossil fuel energy is coming to an end if it's not dealing with its pollution. There yep. are many other ways of doing this and the human brain is very good at solving these challenges. Mm -hmm. We've got capital waiting to be put into projects. We just need to now work out how to get that money flowing into the solutions but and the costs are coming down. Plenty of societies, you know, quite civilised societies, have collapsed, haven't they, Myron? I mean, you know, you can read Jared Diamond's book called Collapse about sort of civilizations that have... And themselves either there. they weren't collapsing from something anthropogenic or they weren't collapsing from something they understood. There aren't examples of, of people who have known the risks, they've known the challenges, they've known how to solve the problem, 
and they've just walked into the But dump. there are people who deny the problem, right? And that, that, there will always be, right? There will always be people who deny but the problem. There are people who think the Earth is flat. Yeah. And we, we have to get over them. Exactly. And they're in the minority. When, we, when I started on this 20 years ago, it was just a small group of NGOs sounding the alarm with a few scientists. Now all the scientists are freaked out and yep. the message is coming across loud and clear. Your article today is just an example of that. We've got the lead story and that's where it should stay until we really make progress. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you.